Man, the NFL draft was disgusting. It disgusted me. I don't even want to think about rookie drafts right now. A lot of you guys probably have rookie drafts tonight, which is why I wanted to make this for you. I wanted you to understand that I'm here with you. I am also disgusted by the time we get to like the 108 in rookie drafts. This video is going to be me rambling for the next 25 minutes about every takeaway I have from the NFL draft as it relates to your rookie drafts, dynasty, fantasy football, all that sheesh. Okay, if at any point you're like, oh, this is kind of heat, you know, hit the button that looks like this, subscribe to the channel. I'll be helping you throughout the offseason, anything fantasy related. I'm going to I'm gonna try to like break apart everything that happened. We're not going to go player by player. I'm just going to kind of talk. I'm just going to sit here and we're going to therapy session it out. Okay. The NFL draft was awesome in round one. Night one was electricity to the highest form. Circuits were breaking. Thought it was a lightning storm coming out here. We had trades. We had wide receivers. And we, had even had, we even had a quarterback. How gracious. No running backs. That shit started in day two. <sighs> but it was not in high volume. And it was not fun. And it was not good landing spots. And I'm looking at rookie. Overall, this was a massive L as it is relative to rookie drafts. The way that the NFL draft played out, and that's for a majority of, uh, there's a few reasons, a few reasons. First of all, any running backs that we thought would be fun second or third round picks ended up going in the fifth, sixth, seventh round of the NFL draft. Or they went in the third or fourth round to awful landing spots. Secondly, the wide receivers who ended up going outside of the first round, for the most part, the guys that went in the second round, some in the third round, were dudes that you've either never fucking heard of or the bad part of the, you know, it's like, oh man, this wide receiver class was sexy. It's like an avocado. You know, you crack open an avocado and it's green. It looks like this and it's ripe, but it would be like if one of these lights was out. You know, you've got that brown spot in the middle. That's like what this wide receiver class was. But then you're throwing Wondell Robinson in the second fucking round to New York. Man, so it leaves you sitting here with this underlying disgust that if you have the 202 or the 203, the value of that pick is in invisible. It's not there anymore. So I'm going to start out this by giving you a sentiment of saying, if you can move your rookie picks for future picks, I would do that yesterday. I would do that. Right now, I would do that in before your draft kicks off. I would do that mid draft. I would, I'd, I'd go to your boy's house and hold him at gunpoint and say, "Click the fucking trade accept button. Do it as as quickly as you can." This is the way I'm looking at it. All right. For instance, Damian Pierce, one of my favorite later round under the radar type dudes, running back out of Florida, wasn't used heavily but wildly efficient on a per touch basis. 220 pounds has the passing chops. Uh, electric, elusive, tough, power, all the fucking buzzwords that people who don't know what the fuck they're talking about like to use. I'm a guy who doesn't know what the fuck he's talking about, so I'm going to use it on you. Damon Pierce, love the kid. If you had told me pre-draft, before the NFL draft kicked off, that he was going to be a fourth-round pick to the Houston Texans, I would say beautiful, right? He doesn't necessarily get enough capital or land in a spot that's sexy enough to warrant upper limit rookie pick capital. So I'm thinking to myself, that happens. You told me that happens. I am making sure I am moving mountains. I'm killing people to make sure that I have the 301 in all of my drafts so I could lock up Mr. Damian Pierce in all of my leagues. Now I'm looking at the board and I'm saying, okay, Damian Pierce went to the Texans in the fourth round. This is this is kind of sexy, right? He lands with Marlon Mack there. He lands with Daria Agumuwale lands with Rex Burkhead there zero competition in that backfield for him to just rip it immediately fourth round to the Texans I'm looking at the draft board and I'm thinking okay in the first round of rookie drafts Kenny Pickett's a first round quarterback he's going to go off somewhere Brees Hall Kenneth Walker the two top running backs obviously going to go off somewhere after that Damian Pierce is my RB3 in this class. You know, you can argue however you want. You might take James Cook because he got some draft capital, lands in Buffalo. You might even be weird and take Isaiah Spiller because he lands in L.A. You might be 
you might like Rashad White's landing spot way more than I do and put him as your RB3. Regardless, the RB3 situation is such a fur, far tier away from RB2 and Kenneth Walker, et cetera, et cetera. So you're saying to yourself, you have these two running backs, you have a quarterback. So you have three players for sure going off in the first round. And I'm thinking, am I even going to get Damian Pierce in the second round? I'm thinking, oh, lock to have him as the 301. No, 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 no. You're going to be lucky to get Damian Pierce when I'm fucking done with his ass at the 201, at the 202, at the 203. It's going to be a problem. You have those three top guys, Pickett, Hall, Walker. I'm not saying top guys like in the order. I'm just saying guys that will be going in the first round. And then guess what? If you think Damian Pierce is not going to be available by 202, that means you're going to need nine wide receivers that you like more than Damian Pierce in order not to push the button on him. So I'm sitting here in leagues where I'm like, I got the 103, the 111, the 112. And I'm like, damn, those 111, 112 picks really just make me somber, man. I'm melancholy. I am sad. I'm a sad boy right now. I'm always sad. This is fucking sad boy spring. Sad boy summer coming in full effect. This shit didn't help. It didn't help by any means. Because now, Damian Pierce, a fourth round running back, I'm going to have to take him at the 112 if I want him, okay? Because, yes, there's sure there's a lot of first-round wide receivers that you're going to want. Top guys, sure. Christian Watson, sure. Sky Moore, sure. Guess what? That doesn't really account for nine fucking wide receivers. It doesn't. Eventually, the math got to add up where you're, like, going out of your way to take a third-round wide receiver just because of the three as a draft capital piece in front of a Damian Pierce who's the fourth. And it's ugly. It's so fucking ugly. So my suggestion to you is try everything you can. I'm looking at this as a tier, the top, 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 top tier of six players. And then there's good ones after that. Maybe put a Lave and Jameson Williams in there if you like them a lot. Maybe eight. I almost feel like it's a six-person tier, a two-person tier, and then everybody fucking else that I don't really want because their value relative. The way you got to look at it, too, is like where these guys would be going in drafts last year or the year before or the year before is 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 just going to be so cringeworthy compared to where you're going to have to take him this year. Like Jahan Dotson, I like the player. He's a wide receiver too at best in fantasy and in an offense. He goes the 16th overall pick, and now you're going to have to take him at like the 109. He would not be the 109 in any class that we've had over the last like fucking eight years. Just It just wouldn't happen. And now you're going to have to do it because everyone's going to be like, he's got first round. I don't give a fuck. I'm not taking Jahan Dotson at the 109. It ain't happening. I'm trying to move those picks. The top tier of guys are going to be the Brees Halls, then the three top wide receivers, Drake London, Garrett Wilson, Traylon Burks, Kenny Pickett. And let me tell let me tell you about Kenny motherfucking Pickett. Kenny Pickett was my he was my favorite quarterback of the class in real life, like pro ready quarterback. Obviously Malik Willis deserved to be ranked ahead of him for fantasy purposes until he got drafted in the third round. And we'll get to the whole quarterback situation. Kenny Pickett goes as the only quarterback in the first two rounds. He goes to pick 20, so he's the only quarterback in the first round, but no one goes until the third round. So he's the only quarterback clearly a tier ahead of everybody else in the NFL. That's what the NFL just told us. And he lands in a situation that's gorgeous, right? I talked about this a couple days ago. Most quarterbacks end up in really toxic situations. This is the opposite of that. It's a great coach. It's a great franchise. It's great fucking weapons. And believe it or not, their pass blocking line last year was top 15 per PFF. Everything is there for him to succeed. And I see people on Twitter yelling at me like, yeah, you know, if you're changing your rankings after the draft and you're not doing it right, I'm like, here's the thing. Here's the thing. There's two ways to look at it. There's talent and then there's situation. One of them is subjective. One of them is objective. The subjective one is talent. The objective one is a situation. The subjective one is talent. And here's what I could objectively say about the subjective one. People, you, me, far overrate our ability to actually understand how talented a player is. Or even even if you can't understand how, how talented a player is, you have no idea how their talent is going to translate to the NFL. What if they got some weird-ass fucking crackhead coach, the quarterback's coach, on a team that you don't know is going to fuck this guy's life up? It's just shit you can't control, right? I bet that's happened. There's probably cokehead coaches that have just fucked up people's careers. You're never going to be able to control that. There's an entire side of the equation that you are just going to be terrible at understanding. So if the situation is good, 
I'm not saying go nuts, right? Kenny Pickett was not my QB5 as the 207, and I'm moving him up to the 104. Kenny Pickett was already my QB2 who I was taking at the 106, and now he's the only quarterback that goes in the first round, in the first two rounds, into a beautiful situation. Y'all think he's going to sit behind Mr. Trubisky. Dog, he's 24 years old. He's been in college for nine years. What is he going to do on this? What is he going to learn from sitting behind Mitch Trubisky? He's not learning fucking anything on the sidelines. He's going to compete for that starting job immediately. And if he loses to Mitch Trubisky, then he wasn't. He didn't deserve to be a fucking starting quarter. He didn't deserve to be a first-round uh, quarterback to begin with. Okay? Y'all really think Mitch Trubisky out here signing Chase Edmonds-type deals is going to be the starting quarterback in Pittsburgh for an elongated time? Maybe he gets two starts. Maybe he gets two games under his belt. He's not staying there forever. Kenny Pickett's the guy. Kenny Pickett is going to start 75, 80%, 100% of games this year as a rookie. You don't draft a 24, 25-year-old rookie to let him sit and develop into Brandon Whedon. It's not how Pittsburgh runs their fucking organization. Let me get that out of the way first. So you've got the, the two running backs up top. You've got the three elite wide receivers in Burks and London and and uh, and Garrett Wilson, depending on however you order them. I personally like London, then Wilson, then Burks. And you've got Kenny Pickett. So that leaves you with six players. And then you get to the second tier of players where I personally don't put Olave or Jamison Williams up in that tier. I think all those guys in that front tier have the ability to be like RB1s, wide receiver ones, QB1s at their position. I think Jamison Williams probably does as well in terms of upside, but his floor is probably a lot lower because we've seen a lot of these, you know, pigeonhole type fast players bust at a very high fucking rate. So he's a little bit scarier in that sound in that sense. And when you weigh it out with a lot of his probably safeness and floor, I, I put them two as a tier by themselves. So if you're in the top six, you got a tier one pick. If you're in seven, eight, you got a tier two pick, which is still pretty good. After that, man, life sucks. Life's a bitch and then you die. Go hit the like button, please, if you know what's good for you. So I'm trying to move those picks as much as I can. I Listen, like the second round, there are a couple dudes that were interesting to me. Let me let me talk about a few situations here. Brees Hall, for sure, 101 for me. Nothing changes. I love the position in New York. That offense is going to be dynamite in two years. Their offensive line, the rebuild that they've done, they've jumped up significantly since Joe Douglas got in the building. Moved up from... 31st ranked offensive line into like the top 18 and they're incrementally moving up investing 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 in that old line and you're seeing it come to fruition the offense is going to be dynamite Michael Carter is still going to play a role that's fine Brees Hall is going to catch 35 40 passes a year doesn't matter we've seen plenty of top end league winning top five type wide uh, running backs succeed without having super heavy pass volume type roles in their offense just think of the last few years and with guys like Zeke you know early early years Zeke and and Derrick Henry and Adrian Peterson's and you know a bunch of Jonathan Taylor like there's a bunch of really good running backs that are really good at running the ball that don't catch a ton of passes but are still fine okay Brees Hall is going to catch 35 to 40 passes a year and Michael Carter can still catch 40 passes a year as well and be involved but that's one of the things I try to tell you guys like I, I try to this is a lesson learned each each year, right? And the video I made um, last week, it was five uh, five mistakes y'all keep making in your dynasty rookie drafts. And one of them was to continue to draft these undersized running backs, right? And Michael Carter is a perfect example where even if I didn't like him as a talent, which wasn't the case, I would just I was fading him in rookie drafts because of his size. And you could say that I was wrong on the take. My logic behind it was that when you're that size, coaches are hesitant to give you the workload, and they just proved me correctly. Michael Carter had arguably the best rookie year you could possibly have given his circumstances. You're an undersized fourth-round running back going into a shitty Jets offense situation, and the kid balled out. He did as good as you could humanly do in that situation, and what did they do? They rewarded him by saying, you're done. We don't care about you anymore. It's going to be a cute one-two punch. It's going to be like Jonathan Taylor, Naeem Hines, Brees Hall, Michael Carr. Michael Carter is going to have a role. Sure, he was great last year. It's great to have him as a breather back. But if you think he actually caps Brees Hall's upside, you're out of your mind. But that is the hesitancy I have with drafting a guy like Michael Carter to begin with. It has nothing to fucking do with talent. All these players are talented. All these players have given a 12 to 15 touch sample size in six to eight games are probably going to look pretty fucking good. The problem is coaches don't give a fuck. We see it every year. We see it all the time. Here's another example of it. 
Y'all were excited about Michael Carter. Well, guess what? The coaches don't give a freak. And now you just paid for it. So think twice before you start overdrafting dudes like that, before you start overdrafting James Cook, before you start overdrafting all these undersized running backs that you think are good because you watched a fucking YouTube highlight clip. The numbers speak for themselves. So we have Brees Hall 101. Kenneth Walker, I actually hate the landing spot. I, I don't know if I could have found a worse landing spot for Kenneth Walker. This is this is so obviously looking like to me, this is something I preach in the offseason a lot, more redraft focus, but Kenneth Walker is going to be a guy that you guys are going to take in redraft leagues in the fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh round because you love his talents. But we've seen this play out every single year. He It was Javante Williams last year. These second-round running backs. It was Javante Williams last year. The year before that, it was DeAndre Swift, Cam Akers, uh, J.K. Dobbins, and Miles Sanders the year before that. These ultra-talented second-round running backs get picked by a team and aren't given the workload in year one. They simply aren't. And you guys continue to think that because you know he's talented, that talent equals volume. Over the long run, yes, that ends up playing out. But in redraft, y'all are going to over... I already know y'all are going to overdraft Kenneth Walker in the fifth and sixth round. And then maybe by like week 13, he gets the starting job and takes over. Like we've been saying for Javante Williams all year. Like we saw said for those, all those other guys all fucking two years ago. It's the same shit. Rinse and repeat every single year. If you're not a first round pick, you're not guaranteed the workload, man. It's the same sheesh. And Kenneth Walker, this is like this played out exactly how the people who were worried about Kenneth Walker, his skill set, were worried about it, played out. That didn't make any fucking sense, but let me explain. We're worried about Kenneth Walker as a pass catcher. And he goes to the situation where you're not going to get the chance to be proven right if you think he's a good cat pass catcher. I ran the numbers, man. I've been up since it's it's fucking 2.30 p.m. right now while I'm filming this. I've been up since 6 a.m. this morning doing research, writing rookie profiles for the draft guide. And Kenneth Walker landing in Seattle is horrible for his passing game upside. I went back and looked at every single season under Pete Carroll. That goes back to 2010. In those 12 years the leading rusher in Seattle's backfield has never caught more than 37 passes. That is a large sample size. Okay. It happened two or three times. Chris Carson did it twice. Marshawn Lynch did it once back in, I think 2014, the average reception total for the leading runner in that backfield was 23 catches. Even looking back to last year, Rashad Penny, when he blew the fucking f opponents away last year, getting the majority of carries, going for a buck 20 a pop, game in, game out. He was not catching passes. It simply wasn't happening. They like the, He likes to use these pass-catching backs. He likes to use a third down back for whatever fucking reason, and we don't need to know the reason. We just need to know that he does it. So Kenneth Walker goes into a situation where, do I think he can catch 35 passes in a season? Sure. But I think that realistic 37 catches as the high is probably his ceiling in the passing game. If that, I don't think that's unrealistic. Like I think I'm sure there will be seasons where he catches 35 passes, right? But I think to expect him just to say like, oh, he's going to catch 40 passes a season is so fucking stupid, and people are going to be out there doing it. I think the realistic expectations is Walker is going to be a very good runner who probably catches closer to 25, 27, 29 passes a year. And that doesn't mean he can't be a baller, right? Like I just said with Brees Hall, who I think is going to be closer to like the 40 to 45 mark, so don't get it fucking twisted. There are players, there are plenty of players, running backs, who have been great without catching a lot of passes. However, the lower your pass catching total goes down, like the harder it is to be great in fantasy football. And you're just playing the odds, man. It's just a fucking spectrum game here, okay? That's what I'm looking at with Kenneth Walker. So he goes into a situation where he won't get those three downs. I'm also not sure at all that he wins a starting job outright to begin with. I think there's a really good chance that this is just a committee for the entire season. Do I think he takes over as the clear lead runner next year? Sure. Also, maybe this is a fucking Denver situation where very easy to say that with Javante Williams, and then all of a sudden they re-sign Melvin Gordon. They re -sign, what if Rashad Penny has a Melvin Gordon-esque year from last year, and they say, hey, we want to sign him again for another year because he was just simply a good football player. But I think this year in particular – we're probably going to see a committee between these two. Listen, like Seattle, you don't keep that kind of player around for five fucking years because you don't believe in him, right? 
even if it was a wrong thing to fucking do. They believed so heavily in Rashad Penny. And then they were proven right at the very last minute. And they bring him back in. If you don't think they're ready to use him again, they play Chris Carson, the seventh round pick, over Rashad Penny, their first round pick, that rookie year. They're going to play whoever they like the most. Whoever they think is best fit for whatever fucking weird shit is going on in Pete Carroll's brain. Kenneth Walker, to me, easiest fade of redraft leagues already. I have no idea where he's going to go. I know where he's going to go, but I haven't actually seen drafts yet. That shit's going to happen, okay? And you're going to hear me talk about the same fucking shtick. It is May 1st. You're going to hear it on June 1st. You're going to hear it on July 1st. You're going to hear it on August 1st. You're going to hear it on September 1st. And guess what? When January 1st hits and fantasy football championships are done with, Kenneth Walker probably won your championship in Week 18. But I'm going I'm to go back and tell you, listen, the first 14 weeks, huge mistake by you outside of, obviously, an injury to Rashad Penny. Y'all get the point. So, Brees Hall, Kenneth Walker's at the 106 for me. I'm taking those three top wide receivers and the quarterback over Kenneth Walker. Alave, love the kid. I don't know if we see the upside of the top three guys. So, Alave, Jameson Williams in there. And then after that, man, it's just, again, it's it's ugly. Um, I will be taking, let me pull up my rankings right quick for you. And then I'm going to pull up the tweet that Sleeper put out today that said, in the past 48 hours, I've tracked 275 rookie drafts that started on Sleeper HQ. While most of them are still ongoing, a lot have already made most of the first round picks. Here is the ADP I have for it. So this dude, Idico underscore FF, I don't know if he actually is affiliated with Sleeper or not or whatever, but they ended up pushing it out as a notification as well. And they have this this image of the first 26 picks and the ADP so far. It does say, I will say, went out this morning at 7.51 a.m. And it says in the past 48 hours, I've tracked 275 rookie drafts, which means Sunday morning, a lot of those rookie drafts could have started. Like I said, y'all are pieces of shit. I know what you'd be doing out there. A lot of you guys be starting your rookie drafts as soon as the first round's over, the night of the first round. So a lot of these numbers are probably skewed based off of the people drafting only having round one information at hand. Okay, I'm going to pull that up in a second. I was going to pull up my rankings real quick to see what the fuck's going on. So we have this big tier basically after um, after those first six guys where it's Alave uh, Williams, and then you have the second my second tier of wide receivers, Sky Moore, Christian Watson, Jahan Dotson. Of those dudes, Sky Moore is the guy for me. Give me fucking Sky. Give me two Sky with one Y. Give me with two Ys. Give me with three Ys. We're not asking why. We're just doing it. Sky Moore. Above Christian Watson. I think Christian Watson's got in the same, for the exact same reason why I have Traylon Burks as the three of the top tier guys, I have Christian Watson as the three of the bottom tier guys. Landing spot obviously couldn't be more beautiful. I think Watson has way more bust potential than those other three guys. I think he's a boomer bust guy. I think Traylon Burks is kind of similar to that. Um, a lot of that has to do with Matt Harmon's reception perception, which is a great fucking resource. I don't know if you guys have ever used it, but go check it out. And he, he grades these guys as route runners, or he looks at every single route and he gives you the percentage in terms of success versus man coverage, success versus zone, success versus press coverage. And Christian Watson did not grade out well. Traylon Burks did not grade out well against man. He graded out in the 11th percentile versus man coverage, man. So the comps for him versus A.J. Brown, he looks like A.J. Brown. He runs like A.J. Brown. He do, he, he do not be separating like A.J. Brown. He does not run routes like A.J. Brown, Okay. That's scary to me. Can he have an unbelievably high volume role in year one because he's playing in Tennessee with fucking not a single respectable wide receiver on the depth chart? Yeah, for sure. These things end up playing themselves out, though. If you cannot beat man coverage at a consistent rate at the NFL level, the team starts to add other pieces. They start to add real separators, either through free agency or the draft, and then your volume ends up coming down. This is all long-term shit, guys. You play the spectrums on a long-term game. And it typically plays itself out. So, Burks is still 105, 106, whatever. But he's at the bottom of the tier of the elite guys. Christian Watson, same thing. I feel way more comfortable with Sky Moore. Then I'll go to Watson. Then I'll probably go to Dotson. Dotson. I just don't think Dotson has a ceiling. I really don't. He could be fine, but it just doesn't intrigue me enough to have a ceiling here. And that's where I get to Damian Pierce. So, right now, legitimately, Damian Pierce is number 12 in my rankings, which means that is the 112, which is why you need to be trading these picks. Damian Pierce, I think he's the starter for Houston by like the second, third week of the season. 
So a lot of me is probably just going to swallow my pride, you know, and just mumble to myself like, damn, I got me a good player, even if he was a fourth round fucking running back. And, um, and I'm going to take him at the, at the 112, at the 201, whatever you got to do. It ain't going to be fun. It ain't going to be pretty, but that's what's going to happen. Um, and there were some dudes that came back from the dead here. There were some dudes that absolutely came back from the dead that I, you know, had, I don't want to say I wrote them off. I just wasn't as high on their talent profile as most people were. Uh, one of them was James Cook, who I have him right behind Pierce. He lands in the second round to Buffalo. Now, no, no fucking secret. Buffalo has been looking for these pass catching running backs this off season. They tried to sign JD McKissick. Something weird happened there. Um, didn't get him right. Then they signed Duke Johnson. So they're looking for this third down explosive back to pair with Singletary, Zach Moss, whatever. They don't want Singletary to be their passing down guy. He's been catching like 45 passes a season, but he literally just like catches them and his yards perception totals are like 5.5, 6.5, like really lowly rank. They want an explosive playmaker out of the backfield for Josh Allen, which I think is awesome. And I think James Cook is awesome at pass catching, right? That's never been a knock I had on him. He's just not going to have an early down roll. Right. And like, what does that actually mean? Can he have like, J listen, J.D. McKissick caught fucking 80 passes or whatever, 60 passes. It was a great PPR back, but that's the ceiling. Right. And I it's hard to buy into that. It's really hard for me to buy into that. He's a 199 pound running back again. Like they they obviously clearly like him. They have a very clear role in mind for him and he'll probably catch 50, 60 passes out of the gate. Problem is, like, it doesn't really go up from there. I don't think he takes early down work. It might be some weird ass committee where you're seeing Devin Singletary on first and second downs. You're seeing Zach Moss mix in there, maybe on the goal line. You have Josh Allen already on the goal line. And then you have James Cook coming in on third downs. I ain't with the shits. So Cook is a guy like Cook is a guy where it's like he's forced up your draft board. He's a guy that I was maybe comfortable thinking about at like the 212, 32, that turn over there. And now if you want him, you're going to have to take him at the 201, 202. Uh, Rashad White, I don't like the landing spot as much as most people would pretend to like it. Like, goes to Tampa Bay, great. But here's the thing. They just re-signed Leonard Fournette to a three-year, $21 million deal. And Fournette did everything to prove that he's a workhorse there. So best case scenario, Rashad White is somehow the starter by next year. Fournette's going to be there for the next two years. That's that's what the contract says. So say he say he needs time to to, to win some sort of role. He doesn't have time. He's old. He's already fucking 23. He's one of the oldest backs in this fucking class. Trout White doesn't have time to develop or win a role. And guess what? By the time he does win the role, Tom Brady ain't there anymore. They're not the Tampa Bay offense that you're trying to buy into. Who says he's a... They got they re-signed Geo. They got Leonard Fournette. I, I think the landing spot for Trout White was way worse than people are making it out to be. I, I don't like it at all. I like the third-round draft capital. That's fun, but I... I don't know. It just feels like everything's lining up for that not to actually make sense. I, there's a ton of red flag for me for Rashad White there. David Bell definitely biked from the dead, though. Love the landing spot in Cleveland. Pair him up with Deshaun Watson. He can be, you know, Jarvis Landry's out, Austin Hooper's out, and, like, who cares? But also they were the top two targets in that offense last year. Um, and, again, Deshaun Watson's there. So we're talking about third-round capital, and now you're paired with Deshaun Watson for the next four or five years. It's You, you can't be out on that. All right, he could be Jarvis Landry plus 20 pounds. He could be a good slot receiver. He can be a possession guy. He can be the fourth option in this offense behind Mark Cooper, Nick Chubb, Kareem Hunt, and then him. I mean, on paper, it's an offense that's going to run. Run run well, I should say, right? Run smoothly. Move down the field. Have a lot of passing opportunities. Keep the ball in their hands. More plays, more volume, more scoring ops. That's that's a piece I want. So David Bell, great second-round fucking target now. Uh, George Pickens, messy. I think that's a fucking huge L for Claypool. Jalen Tolbert going to Dallas. That's pretty messy. Kind of disappointing. I wish he went somewhere with a with a more open depth chart. Uh, Isaiah Spiller, another guy, fucking bike from the dead. Can't believe I'm saying this, you know. And I tweeted this thread out earlier today. Make sure you follow me at Nick Ercolano. Um, Isaiah Spiller might be one of my most targeted guys. He he goes to the Chargers in the fourth round. And he's the perfect compliment to Eckler, man. He is the perfect compliment to Eckler. They've been looking for a big body back. And they've tried with Josh Kelly. They've tried with Roundtree. Every, they've been looking for it to do that little combo one-two punch since they had Melvin and Austin Eckler. And now they got it. Spiller's way better than those other two. But it's kind of funny that they're mentioned in the same vein. Just so many people had Spiller's RB1 in this class. And that shit's just fucking embarrassing. Spiller lands in LA. And he's going to get 100 and 70 touches off the rip, probably a lot of goal line opportunities. Because you look at Austin Eckler's career here in L.A., and his rushing touchdown totals have been like two, one, three, one. 
goal line opportunities like four, one, seven, zero. And then last year just blew the fuck up because they didn't have that big body back. I think we're much more likely to see Spiller take back over that goal line role. And this is a Chargers offense top five in scoring last year. This is a Chargers offense. They they were like they're doing the same game plan as the Jets, where you build as many pieces on the offensive line around that quarterback, that young rookie quarterback or rookie contract quarterback as you can. And they went up from 32nd in the league in run blocking on their line to 11th. Like those investments are paying off big time. And that's going to be big for Isaiah Spiller. Okay. Spiller's, Spiller's going to be a nice little pick. He's not only like got some standalone value, but he might arguably be the single best handcuff in all of fantasy football right now. He really might have that role. So while people who liked him to begin with were very, very wrong on who he was as a prospect, he's still a nice rookie pick now based on how shitty the NFL draft went. Who else is interesting? I know y'all are really going to think Samir, uh, Tyler Algier is interesting in Atlanta. I promise you he's not as interesting as you think he is. One, it's fifth-round draft capital. Two, he's not a guy that makes things for him. Everyone's like, oh, the Atlanta spot is such a good landing spot. Like, guys, Atlanta fucking sucks. Atlanta fucking stinks. They're not opening up holes. Algier needs that because he's not elusive. He doesn't create on his own, so he needs the offensive line to create for him. He's going to be great on the goal line. Atlanta's not going to have fucking goal line opportunities, okay? You're buying into this narrative of Atlanta being a good op- a good spot because of volume. He's a fifth-round running back. He's not going into guaranteed volume. Cordell, Mike Davis, Damian Williams. There's going to be some weird, stupid committee there. I have no idea what Arthur Smith is thinking. Last year, he was using Cordell Patterson as the thumper back, and Mike Davis as a third-down pass catching back. Like, what is that? Taylor Algier can have can be what Mike Davis was. He could be what Todd Gurley was in 2020, where Todd Gurley was awesome for fantasy. Nine touchdowns in like fucking eight games. Awesome, but terrible in real life. Taylor Algier can have that role where he's going to be as successful as the opportunities lend him to have success there, okay? Algier is not the player y'all thought he was again. We've been on these fucking rookies, man. We've been on point since fucking January, February with the rookies. Y'all keep getting cute with all the rookies. We'll keep telling you the goddamn facts. Algier's landing spot... It makes him sure like an intriguing end of the second round rookie pick, but I promise you it's not as good as you think it is. I'm going to take him above some of the second round wide receivers like Wondell Robinson and John Mechie, man. I hate, I, I'm really not a fan of those guys. Uh, the quarterbacks, y'all are, you know, I know this is going to be a question that I get a lot. You know, what are we doing with Corral, Ritter, Willis, who all fall to the third round of the NFL draft, which makes them obviously fall out of the first round of rookie drafts? which is why this is the main reason why rookie drafts are so bad this year because typically quarterbacks end up propping up all the skill players and you get the Chris Olaves at 111, 112, and you're able to get Damian Pierce at the 205, the 207, the 209 because of all the quarterbacks that are usually going early. Now we have these guys drop the third round, and here's the way I'm looking at it, all right? So Matt Corral goes to Carolina. I think he is for sure the quarterback most likely to get onto the field quickest and be successful. Sam Darnold obviously ain't it there. I would I would be surprised if Krause not on the field like semi early into the season, which makes him in my mind most valuable. You have Desmond Ritter, who I'm just personally not a fan of, but I'm going to rank him probably, man, really hard to rank him above Willis, but I wouldn't be surprised if Ritter gets on the field this year either with Mariota at quarterback. They may just be dumping this entire fucking year though. I hope they are. I hope we go fucking 1-15, 1-16, in in whatever the new rules are. And I hope we get Bryce Young or C.J. Stroud, and then it's wheels the fuck up for Drake London and Kyle Pitts. That would be exciting. Then we'd have some fun in Atlanta for the first time in 40 fucking years. That's what we need. I need it. I need me some Bryce Young. I don't need me Desmond Ritter. Also a third-round pick, so don't get overly excited again. Malik Willis goes to Tennessee. Yo, Tennessee is dangerously close to going to full re- – despite being the AFC champs, they are dangerously close to going to full rebuild mode, man. Dangerously close. Derrick Henry's old coming off the foot injury. Tannehill's got one more year of guaranteed money on his deal. They could obviously re-sign him, but they could easily let him go after next season. They let go of A.J. Brown. Like, what are they doing? It doesn't seem like they have any sort of game plan right now, which lends me to think that, like, you know, they replace A.J. Brown with a guy that they hope to be A.J. Brown. I don't understand. That shit, shit just doesn't make sense to me. Don't make no damn sense to me. So uh, Malik Willis could get on the field next year. Could not. Could not. Could be two years. Could be three years. When he gets on the field, yeah, he's going to be good. The problem is, like, 
he needs to show a lot in order for them to trust him to be the guy that they turn to, you know? So, yeah, he'll probably be the heir apparent. And I don't blame you for taking him over either of those other two guys. Problem is, those guys are going to get on the field quicker. And at least you'll know what you have quicker rather than them sitting on your taxi squad or rather than sitting on your bench waiting to see what you have and hoping that he hits. Because as soon as one of these guys gets on the field as a starting quarterback, like you have the opportunity to trade them too, right? They do one good thing and people are going to go up, going to go fucking nuts. So right now I have Corral as my 18th player off the board. I have Ritter as 20 and Malik Willis as 21. It's a tough sell having... Willis, third of those guys, QB4 overall. But he's he's going to be the last one of these guys to get on the field, man. He really is. You can compare him to Jalen Hurts if you want. Jalen Hurts was drafted quicker. Jalen Hurts was far more pro-ready when he came out. I mean, he went to Alabama. He went to Oklahoma. He was playing against real NFL fucking players all the time. Playing with them, against them, around them, training with them, you know, doing that stuff. He was ready. He might have needed to improve a little bit. He still needs to improve a little bit. But Malik Willis is a different mold than Jalen Hurts. He's going to need more time. He's going to get it because he's a third-round pick. Okay, NFL teams don't look at quarterbacks in the third round and say, like, that's our future. That's a value pick. They say, oh, he dropped to us. I guess we're going to do it. So that's a quarterback situation. As we get deeper, we'll just go over a couple guys I think you should be for sure targeting. Like I said, I like Sky Moore as the – top of that second tier my favorite second round picks quietly turn into Damian Pierce David Bell Isaiah Spiller Matt Corral Um, Trey McBride's I guess kind of interesting goes to the Arizona Cardinals is the only second round tight end pick but they got Zach Ertz of course he'll probably be out sooner rather than later but they did just resign him so I don't know dude I guess McBride's the heir apparent but another guy you're probably gonna have to sit on a little bit I actually really like Zamir White though Zamir White lands in Las Vegas and they did not pick up Josh Jacobs' fifth-year option. So there's a chance that that's Samir White's backfield as early as next year. I just like him as a player. So that's kind of an interesting spot. Uh, hate Brian Robinson. Tyrion Davis-Price, San Fran was weird. Keontae Ingram to Arizona is like low-key. All right. But James Conner's contract is going to have him there for two years. Um, but it's a big L for you know, Benjamin. We really like Jelani Woods out there in Indy. That's a sexy little spot there. Uh, they do still have Mo Ali cox but that... They're going to run some fun-ass plays in the red zone on the goal line, man. I'll tell you that. They're going to run some fun fucking plays out there in Indy when they are on the goal line between Jelani Woods and Mo Alley Cox looking like the fucking Empire State buildings out there. That shit's going to be heat. The Patriots, I don't know what the fuck they were doing, bro. Drafting Pierre Strong and Kevin Harris is ruining the lives of both of those guys. No need for that. No need for that. They have families. They have families. Didn't need to draft both of them when you already fucking have Damian Harris and Ramondre Stevenson. Those guys are just... You have they have to be fades at this point. Pittsburgh is interesting, man. They go pick it, they go pickins, and they go Calvin Austin. Calvin Austin at this point he's fucking Ray Ray McLeod to that offense. So those y'all, the guys that were really really high on Calvin Austin, y'all got saved here because you're gonna look at Pittsburgh and say there's it's too messy there. I don't want him anyways. So he drops pretty far for me. Uh, anyone else I like? I like Jeremy Ruckert, the tight end to New York. I think he's a fourth round guy. You can you can grab and feel okay about. That's really it, man. Everybody else kind of stinks. Everybody else kind of stinks. Jaron Ely is a practice squad guy uh, that was picked up by the Chiefs after the draft. Kennedy Brooks, my guy, was picked up by the Eagles, and I love that landing spot. So if you're looking to prioritize any guys after the draft for your taxi squads, Kennedy Brooks would be a pick for me. Jaron Ely would be a pick for me. Uh, Carson Strong goes to Philly. I mean, he was always – I. they'll really give a microphone to anybody these days, man. I could go back on Twitter right now and look at people talking about Carson Strong as a QB1 in this class. I could. I can't do it. I'm not going in on him right now. As you can see, I don't have the energy. I'm just still so disgusted by this fucking NFL draft. Um, Yeah, that's that's really all I got. I just wanted to riff for like 20. Wow, it's 40 minutes in, huh? Holy shite. Didn't realize I've been sitting here that long. I didn't even take one fucking break. Damn, I'm good. Ate so many fucking Chick-fil-A fries this weekend. It's got me energy coming out my ear holes and sheesh. All right. um, That's really it. Yeah. I mean, you guys are probably prepping for your rookie drafts. And you can drop any comments that you have. You can tweet at me, at Nick Ercolano. You can follow us on Instagram and TikTok, at BDGE with two underscores. Um, 
I just want to help you all out before the rookie drafts. I know a lot of you guys draft tonight, so hopefully this did just that for you guys. If it did, make sure you hit the thumbs up button. Subscribe to the channel if you're new. And uh, I, I'll probably I'll try to put out as much content as humanly possible on the NFL draft this week so that the guys who are drafting next weekend are plugged the fuck in. All right. I love you. That's it. Goodbye.